go. While we were in Tel Aviv, actually we met a lot of interesting people, and one of the people on one of the rallies we had, which they were quite often, was a a, a gentleman with snow white hair, and his name was Ben Gurion. Ah. Yeah, and he, I remember him standing there on the podium and um, oh. talking to everyone, you know. He was a very interesting man, very interesting man. This but was in the DP camp. In the DP camp, yes, in, uh, you know, it's south of Munich. It's, so, it's next uh, on Starnberg on the, on the Zee. Uh, he was a very interesting person. But, you know, life goes on. We meet people and... Uh, my cousin, she met a young fella, uh, Monik. He he came from Plotkov, you know, that's south of Warsaw, and he lost all his family. Every one of them. There was not even his extended family left. He was the only survivor from a huge, huge family. How did he survive? How did he? How was he? He prepared? actually he was sent to in the beginning. He was actually working in a factory in Piot Group itself. And whatever they were manufacturing must have been very in, very secret to the Germans because all the people who were working in that factory were kept right in the factory. They rearranged that they had living quarters there. Oh. They, they never left. They were kept right there on the premises. But it was not too many of them, maybe a hundred or maybe eighty. And then when the time, when they were done and they were liquidating that factory, he was sent with the rest of them to Dachau. And this is where he was liberated in Dachau. But well, the, the time was right. I mean, normally if he was sent earlier to Dachau, he might have killed him. Well, true. Evidently, the, the, the fact that whatever they were working on, is something I never found out. You know, whether he wasn't talking about it or didn't want to talk about it, he never talked much about it, about his life in a camp either. So, sometimes you don't press people. Right. You don't, if they don't want to speak about it, then you, it's best to leave it alone. Yep. But, yeah, like he, they met and, uh, <laughs> Since there was no male in other in Rose's family, then she came to me to I was the one who, to okay it uh, whether he or she should if they both should get married, and they did marry, and of course they're still married today. You know they're older people. He's got Alzheimer's now, and she lives up. They both live in Toronto, Canada. And um, children. they have children. They have uh, two grown boys and one grown daughter. The daughter is 65 years old. Oh. She was there only when she was born in Germany uh, before they came to, uh, to Canada. Miriam, yeah, she's the one who, I was the only person in the family who could feed her. She would not take the food from anyone else. <laughs> really, she would. She would. Uh, she would scream and she would holler, and I was the only one, you know, would give her and she'd eat. Um, they live in Toronto. Yes, they have. Uh, she has. Uh, I think the last time we talked to, she has uh, fourteen grandchildren. Wow! And uh, whenever she feels down and complains about her health. She says she doesn't want to continue anymore. She she feels she wants to give up. And I said, look, look what you've created. You brought life to so many people. And they will bring life to more people. And I'm sure they're going to be better people than we were. I mean, if we, are, we are just... You know, we're just visiting this earth. Everybody's just a visitor. We, we kind of just temporary keepers. And you know, come on, we all want to leave a better you know, world for the next bunch of people who come along. You know, when you rent an apartment, you don't leave it in shambles. You clean it up and you leave it the way you bro you found it. And if we do that, we accomplish something. Yeah. But you. 
you accomplished even more. Out of the ashes of your family, look what you've created. You are the only child in your family. Your father, he died of a heart attack uh, about a year before we were forced into the ghetto. So he died of natural causes. I think that's a very good way to go compared to the Holocaust. And your mom, she passed away, and she passed away in Auschwitz. She was sent from uh, from uh, Plaschow on Mother's Day. They made sure and arranged a transport of Jews, especially women, on Mother's Day, and sent them to Auschwitz to the gas chambers as a present. This is... Uh, Nazism in its best. That's, you cannot get any lower than this. When we were in Feldafing, our uncle, Uncle Adolf, who used to be was in Germany, he wanted to join the Polish army and he came over only about days before the war started. And he went to Warsaw to meet up with his buddies, with his old one, World War I buddies. But when he got to Warsaw, the uh, high command, the Polish high command, has moved further east. So he followed them. And by the time he got there, they moved again because the Germans were advancing so fast. Needless to say, he followed them all the way through the Russian interior until he got to the east in the Russian interior to Vladivostok. Over there, that small Polish government or his army bodies <coughs> got together, they got on a boat and they sailed to Canada. And they all settled down in Stratford, Ontario. And they kind of built a small little Polish colony there. And Uncle found out that we were in Germany. He found sponsors. And he sponsored us to come to Toronto, Canada, which we did. My brother, he was in the British zone. And the British zone, for some strange reason they didn't have as many DPs as the American zone had and it was easier for him to emigrate on his own and he left to Toronto actually from, from the British zone and that was interesting because by the time we got there he was there already established and he, he greeted me with his new name he says I'm not Sigmund Knoblauch anymore. I'm Sidney Noble. <laughs> so your name will be Oscar Noble if you want to. But it would be only fair because he says you will find that spelling your name is going to be hard. <laughs> the first thing they say, spell your name. And you won't know how to spell your name. So Noble is short. N-O-B-L-E. You can remember that very easily whether you speak English or not. So it became. Very Actually, it, I did it legalized. I did it in a legal manner a few years later. But, yes, we finally got on a ship, my mother and I, and we traveled to, uh, to Halifax, Canada. And uh, while on at sea... I, can still, I cannot sit still, and everybody was offered a job, and I said, yes, I would like to work, and I became a waiter. I was on waiting the on the ship oh. in the mess hall for the officers. <laughs> so, And I used to go in the elevator down to the warehouse. They'd give me a list what to bring. They would write it down in pictures nice. because I didn't know how to speak English, and I would bring it up in the elevator that was never been on a ship before especially an elevator on a ship in a warehouse with food <laughs> and um, 
they offered me a job in the merchant marine. It was an open job. It wasn't a merchant ship. It was a general housing. And uh, it was an old transformed troop transporter. And um, they said they will be traveling. He said, for two years, if you sign up for two years, you will get, I think it was $2,000. Your mother was on the ship. Yes, yes. But, of course, I didn't accept. I, I listened to the... Uh, to to what the offer was, and of course you would be a citizen after two years, and you get to see the world for free. Yeah. And all your board and room and food is free. The two thousand dollars is yours, and after that you can reassign again. But if you reassign, you would be a petty officer. That means you would get more money, and again, you know, you can work yourself up until you become a captain. But if I would have been single, there's a good possibility that I might have said yes. But I had, you know, I had my mom, I had my brother, I had a sister. You know, I said no. And everything is fine and dandy. So I remember when we came to uh, to Halifax, they didn't want to give up so easily, and they they said, "Look, your train." Uh, is not leaving for about four or five hours. He says, we, we need to take you to the local bar. We have to introduce you to the life in Canada. And so they took me, and of course, you know, they introduced me to everybody in there that I'm a newcomer. And uh, You were a merchant marine at that time? No, no, they wanted they me wanted to. to and But, you know, as a newcomer, you know, you... you you toast the newcomer, and yeah. it got to the point that I think we have it overdone a little bit because I remember, all I can remember, we were racing in that car through the town to get to the railway station, and the train was just about leaving, and I, they just barely pushed me on it. Wow. And my mom was very worried, you know, where's my son? And so we ended, we came to Toronto and we were taken in by this family for two weeks. And, um. It was prearranged. Prearranged. Yeah. And they had to vouch for us that we would not be a board, burden to the government. Uh, she will provide a job for us. They were Jewish, a Jewish family, they're elderly people. Uh, and uh, she looked at me and she says, uh, you need to gain some weight. It's a, if we have a strong wind, the wind's going to blow you down. And <clears throat> so she says, there is an opportunity. It just so happens that it opens up in two days. There was a youth camp, because that was in the summer, or the late summer. It and would have been how old at that time? 21, 20, 21, 20. And she says, you're going to go to that camp for six weeks. And you're not just going to sit there. Since you told me that you did some, you were a waiter on the ship, well, you're going to be a waiter there too. You're going to be waiting food. You're going to be serving food to all the children who come there to stay for the, for the summer vacation. And on weekends, their parents come to visit and they have to be, of course, uh, served food as well. And you'll be doing that for the six weeks. Interesting job. Meant, met a lot of people. And learned a lot of English because they had counselors from the United States and from Toronto. And they, of course, you know, I had to mingle with them after work. And uh, everybody wanted to talk to me. And I wanted to talk to them. And between a little bit of Yiddish and and, and a little bit of... Learn, you learned a little Yiddish? Oh, Yiddish I knew. I didn't know that you... Uh, I thought you had, you knew Russian and Polish. And Polish, Jared, German, Polish and German. Yiddish. Oh. Yiddish is a, is a byproduct. You, whether you like it or not, you associate with Jews in Poland. You got to learn. You you know Yiddish. You spoke when you grew up in the family. Did you speak in your home? Yiddish? No. German? Polish. 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 With my brother, I spoke German because he didn't want to speak German, Polish. <laughs> he was very bad in Polish. <laughs> okay. Even in his later years, very little. So you were fluent in three languages. Yeah. 
Terrific. That, that was fine. It, it, it is good to be able to converse uh, with more than just one particular type yes. of people. Yeah. You know, I wish I could speak, you know, Spanish or Italian, uh, French. That would be nice. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can't, you, you can't have it all. But and yeah, you were, the, the, you were a waiter. I was, a, yeah, it, that was nice. And uh, I, I came home after six weeks. I weighed at least about fifteen pounds more. My mom hardly could recognize me, <laughs> and uh, I had seventy-eight. I think it was seventy-eight dollars in my pocket. That was, all. Those were uh, tips from the parents because you know when they found out and. And they also they they would come and say, we are here for one day, and we want to spend a lot of time with our children. We want to be waited on real fast. And if you can do that, you're going to have a good tip. And by God, I was just blitzing around. <laughs> I was all over the place. By the time the other tables, the other waiters were serving their desserts, mine were drinking coffee, and oh. they were out. So that was became good. A good waiter. Yeah. yeah, and then of course Mrs. Esser had the job ready for me, and my first job was at Tip Top Tailors. A, a, they, they were making suits. They had many stores throughout Canada, and they were making suits. I was in the mail order department, and I had a. Uh, I was working with a black person, and uh, or should I say Negro? Or black, it doesn't really matter. To me, it doesn't matter. To me, he didn't look black. He was a person. So I worked with that person, and he was an ex-teacher from Halifax, Canada. He started a little bit, and he lost his position. His stuttering became really uh, 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 bad, so that he had to give up. But he was working there with me, and a uh, very interesting gentleman. And um, this was uh, my first dose of being in a free, if you call it free, democratic country. Now, how free was it? Okay. So I'm working, in, in, and uh, he says, it is lunchtime. We have to go to the cafeteria. And so... Because he takes me with me, I'm going with him up to the cafeteria, and we enter in the cafeteria. And he says, "Stuttering, I'll I'll see you downstairs in a little while." And he walks up to the left side, and I follow him, and he says, oh, "No, you have to go to the right side." I said, cautiously, "Why?" And then I realized that. On the left side, they're all black, and on that side, they're all white. And I said, what is going on here? Then he explained to me, that's what you call segregation. And we were going home the same direction. He had to go in the back part of the tram, of the streetcar, and I had to say goodbye to him and go there. But I said, no. He said, we're going to the same place. I'm going to be with you. And I walked right in there. So the people look at me. Funny so. So what is it? I could not understand. This is supposed to be a free, a democratic country. And this is what we have? Well, that was just a little eye-opener. There was more to come. Because I was not satisfied with my $18.25 a week job. I figured there's got to be people making more money than that. So I got myself another job and I got work in a stainless steel place, which I was earning $64. But I almost lost my thumb because that was hard work. You know, there was, we're talking about everything is handmade. Stainless steel sheets, cutting by hand with snippers. They, you know, it kind of bounces back on you and catches you if you're not careful. And I was new at it. So I look into the paper and I see there's a, an advertisement. A man is looking for an apprentice in, in dentistry. 
Now, I did have some experience in that just shortly before the war and in the first months of the war, working as an apprentice at a dentist in Krakow. So I wrote my resume to him, and uh, he calls me after a few days, and I'm all excited. I'm going up, and uh, we're talking, and here's what he says. He's an orthodontist, beautiful office, older gentleman. He has no children, and he says in two or three years or four, he might be retiring. He would like to leave his practice in capable hands in someone who really deserves it. Now, that person who, did, who he will choose will have to agree to certain conditions. And the conditions were the most fabulous conditions anyone can dream of. That he must continue school, go to college, get the education. And then, of course, when the time is ripe, he would take over this practice. No questions asked. Wow. And uh, he interviewed me. He was very happy. And he said, well, he says, if you give your notice on the other job, you can start here on Monday. I, was, I told my uncle out of that, and he was very upset. He said, did you talk to Mrs. Esser, the people who sponsored me? that you were applying for this job. I said, no. He says, you best go ahead and talk to her about it because she still is responsible for you. And uh, I think the place where you applied for, there's something I'm not sure about. But on the application, she said, he said to me, he said, did you fill everything out? I said, no, I left one thing open. Oh, I know what it was. Religion. I said to myself, well, you know, I don't see with earth shaking what religion you are when you apply for a job. I mean, you either do the job, makes no, no, no difference what you are, as long as you do the job. If you don't do the job, then you don't. But what has that religion to do with that? Oh, you better talk to her. She was upset. She says, number one, you lied. You did not fill out the application. Number two, the Ford Medical Building on Bay Street is off limits to Jews. Welcome to Canada. I said, what do you mean? He says, there are no practitioners in that building who are Jewish, and no one is allowed to work there who is Jewish, because it is the Ford building. I said, you know, he doesn't know that you're Jewish. So you better go there and fill it in and tell him that you want to set the straight, and then you have to politely say no. When I walked in, he knew something is not right because it wasn't a Monday, it was a Friday morning. And he said, I said to him exactly, you know what I just repeated, to which he said, why did you do that? I knew you were a Jew. I said, your, your resume tells it, you're a survivor. He said, now, I have no choice but to say, well, as long as I didn't know, He was willing to yeah. if you lied. He, lied. he, he was, ex well, you know, I didn't, I looked clean. I looked very presentable. I didn't look like, oh, here goes a Jew. And so sometimes, you know, when you're honest, honesty sometimes does not pay. Not always. But that was an eye-opener for me. I said to myself, well, we're back to the old grind here. The old grind. Learning experience. Yeah. Well, okay. I stuck it out with that, and uh, so you got in, another job. No, I stayed. I stayed with the with the, uh, with, the, with, the with this thing as long as I could, 
And then I went actually for a very short period of time. I worked for for a guy in the uh, in the metal business, metal. the scrap business, metal. scrap metal. Of course, meanwhile, I met my wife, and I couldn't see her because I couldn't get to the United States because she was from the United States. So we met on the Rainbow Bridge <laughs> in the middle of it. But then finally, you know, she decided to come over to Canada and stay for a week. And so we had a better, so everybody got to know her. And uh, she was living then in New York. How did you meet? Was it on a blind date? or? What? It was actually through somebody who saw her and was a photograph. I looked at it. She saw a photograph of me, and she said, oh, that's okay. And I said, that's okay. <laughs> she was a beautiful woman. and uh, The right age. The right age, and everything worked out fine. Then we exchanged telephone numbers, and I talked to her as much as I possibly could. My English was getting good. I went to night school, and I learned uh, in, in night school to speak, you know, proficiently. And uh, so that was fine. And then... You know, she came over to Canada, and we got married in Canada. We stayed there for a while. She got a job. Her and family was in the U.S. Yeah, they were. They lived in in St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest city. Did you go meet the family? Yes, the yes. We, we went to live there for ten years. Oh wow! Yeah. You went after you were married. After we got married, yes. You got married in Canada. In Canada, and we got married in Canada. And then after a while, she says, well, you know, I have to go ever so often to the States to renew my visa. And it's becoming a, a, a kind of a, a bother. Why don't we just, she says, and, and you're not, you're not liking what, you don't like what you're doing. Let's go to, let's go back home. She said it. Let's go back home. And her Florida, dad, Florida. St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. And her dad had already prepared a little, the old fashioned general store. And so he equipped it to a certain extent, half ways, and he says, let's try it out. I said, I've never done this. She's, he says, what have you done? So that's one more thing you're going to be doing. So you try it. And uh, interesting, because we were on the borderline, what they call Black Town and White City. And I get to know everybody wanted to come because she was born there. So because she was born there, everybody in the neighborhood, especially the blacks, wanted to come and meet the Yankee. See, I was considered to be a Yankee coming from the north. They didn't care whether I came from Poland or Germany. I'm a Yankee. I came from the north. And there was one particular incident which is worthwhile mentioning as the people were coming in and out one day this old little lady comes in she must have been five foot one or two gray hair it wasn't too well done but it was very becoming and she had that smile on her face her face very weathered you know all those but that smile was this 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 sweet smile, this, this, this good smile. And she kind of looked straight through that st steel eyes, looking in my eyes. And she held her hand out and she said, I am Henny Harris. And I said, I'm Oscar Noble. Nice to meet you, Mrs. Harris. And that hand of her, as little as it was, kept squeezing my hand more and more. And her face, her smile, turned into tears. And this woman must have been 80-some-odd years old. And she said to me, she says, you are the first white man who called me Mrs. Harris. Do you know? Good story. Wow. That's jerker. sad. It's a tearjerker. It's so sad. Of course, you know, the South was totally segregated at that time. Yeah. 
totally in 60 and I I was so mad I you said when you married in 1960 what I married in 58 okay. and, and, and I was so mad and my wife said you watch your step this is the south I said the south I was in front of the Nazis I don't care about I don't give a damn about the south they are nothing to me and you know here I'm considered to be a Yankee uh, the police department is giving me a hard time to give me my driver's license because I'm a Yank I came down to the south and I said no wait a minute we're going to get this straight I'm here in the store and I'm running this store and I'm down here I'm neither a southerner I'm not a Yankee I'm a human being period that's what I am so don't don't give me a title here and this man had me come four times taking the driver's test I drove in Canada in the biggest traffic in Toronto and in New York City and in the small stinky St. Augustine where they have horses and, 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 and buggies he's trying to tell me I don't know how to drive well one day he comes humbling in to my store parked his car outside Oh, howdy, folk. How you doing? Do I know you? Yeah, you know me. Sure you know me. I'm the Yankee, don't you know? Oh, that's right. Well, how you all doing? I said, I'm fine. So I'm here to sell some tickets to the police ball. I said, I don't dance. I said, I don't dance with sullenness. Okay. Out. That's how I, I handle things. When I get mad, I get mad. And Mrs. Harris, she became my customer, and I chauffeured her around in my brand new Buick all over town, brought her to her house, carried her groceries into her house. Wow. I told her to sit in the car until I come around and open the door for her. Wow. I don't care. Don't, you don't like it? Well, that's tough. That's the way I like it. Why your wife take that? Well, she, she agreed. She just said, I hope nothing happens to you. I said, yeah. what the heck is going to happen to me? Were you threatened? <sighs> no. I was threatened. I would go to Blacktown where no white men would venture to go because word got around who I was yeah. and they let me go anywhere I wanted to white man even the sheriff his people wouldn't go to, to Blacktown ever it's, it's a wonder black people didn't beat you they up. gave me a tour they gave me a tour they had a, a, a college a black college there the dean gave me a nice tour showed me the college and everything they had a school because it was totally dead segregated was completely black, you know, it was a regular school. And, um, you know, they had support from the government, like food-wise. They would get uh, a bologna in, in five, one, five, bologna and spiced meat, all the lunch meats and cheeses came all in a bulk, which they had to get sliced. And before I had the store there, there was another guy, it was a white man on the corner, and uh, he would charge them for slicing this, and he would steal part of this from what each. What kind of store did you have? I what they call it was a, was I would a say a, a small general store. We had groceries and we had clothes. I had clothes, <laughs> shoes. You want to buy shoes, pants, shirts? You know, work so shirts. Had a, I had it. Had yeah, a meat slicer there. Yeah, so I had a big meat slicer. <laughs> And uh, I would say to them, you just bring it and I slice it. And I'll even, I tell you what, don't bring it, I'll come and pick it up and I'll bring it to you. <laughs> then I put, another, I put another hat on. I said to myself, well, the store was doing actually very well. And I enlarged the store. My meat department became bigger. I needed somebody to cut meat. So there was a family, Mrs. Sparrow. She had four big sons. So was Eddie. 
the Johnny B was already my little guy in the store, cleaning up, you know, taking out some groceries. So I said, Eddie, you're going to be my butcher. He says, you got to be kidding. He says, me? you got white people come here. I said, if they don't like you, they don't have to come. But I don't know how to do butching. I don't know how to cut meat. You learn. I'll, I didn't know it either. I'd show you how it's done. I showed them. I gave them lessons. I showed them. And the day came. My wife was beside herself. She <laughs> says, you're going to ruin the whole business. Nobody's going to come. I said, so I'll do something else. <laughs> what a guy. Well, I lost a few of them. Few, few customers, but not, but all. not all. They all got used to it. Wow. Yep. Maybe some of the customers started to like Eddie. Yeah, they liked Eddie, and Eddie got married because he was able to, because I pay, paid him a good wage. Yeah. So, it, you know... It, I smell lunch. Yep. Yeah. So you want to cut it? We no, can... No, be, no. Yeah, I think you, it's okay if he finishes. Yeah, go ahead, finish. That's okay. So, Take your time. I stayed there for, the store did very well. It did so well that I set this other jerk out of business <laughs> on the corner, the guy who was cheating on, on, on the black people. Did he have the same kind of store you had? Yeah. Similar. Yeah, no closing, just, just groceries. Food. Food. Groceries. Food. Yeah, food. but I, 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 I had to build a, a big cooler on... You know, because I, they used to bring, I used to cut up all quarters of beef. Wow. You know, because I knew how to do this. How did you, I learned. How, how did you learn that? That's a, well, that's when it's, it's, it started getting well. And the, the, sales priest, the salesperson who came in, the meat salesperson, he came in, he says, you'd be better off to buy and buy it. You can make more money. I said, well, I got to cut it up. He says, no problem. You come to Jacksonville, Florida, a few times. He says, if you stay there, they'll teach you. He said, they'll love it because this way they can sell you a whole quarter beef, two, two pieces or whatever, even the hog, the pig. You know, you cut it up yourself. You hang it up in your meat room there in the back. You got the, you got everything. You got the saw. You, you know how to cut the That's beef. Amazing. If, look, there's nothing to it. There's nothing to it. You put a hat, a butcher's hat on, you're a butcher. You put a baker's hat on, you're a baker. <laughs> <laughs> Your hands work a little differently. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, yes, I was scared when uh, Eddie, I said, Eddie, look, one thing. Your hands are very important. You know, knives, you've got cleavers, you've got knives. The slicer, okay, that's not so good. I said, the meat grinder, now that is a baby. I said, you got to watch. Yeah, that's a powerful thing. That's a big meat grinder. You don't, don't put your hands ever in there. I said, you've got this poker. I said, this is your this is your tool. You throw it in there, and then you use that. And if it gets stuck, you turn it off. You don't put your hand in there. Listen. That's important. So I don't want you to be become an invalid. No, I don't think he did. And um, business went very well. I enlarged it. It got so well that we had a chain up there called the A&P in the United States in the East Coast. The what? A&P. I worked there. Yeah. In Chicago. See? A&P. And they came down. They saw. They must have sent somebody. The next thing, down on the corner, they opened up a big A&P. And they practically put me out of business. Oh. I, couldn't, I competed with them for a year. I tried and tried. I just couldn't. I couldn't. You know, their prices, it, it was impossible. Prices were better. Huh? But I got even with them. How? Because I left St. Augustine. We all left St. Augustine one day, just point blank, and said, okay, we're leaving. Where are we going? Upstate New York. What do you, who do you got upstate New York? Nobody. So where are you going? Well, I don't know. We're gypsies now. We just go. We got the money, we sold the business, sold the house, so we go. We end up in Mayo Park, New York, 60 miles north of New York City. We buy a house, which wasn't even finished yet. Uh, we had enough money for the down payment, but not quite. We needed a second mortgage. So the people who were real estate agents, Mr. and Mrs. Cook, 
nice Jewish couple, uh, wanted to sell that house, but here I am, I needed that extra $5,000. So they said, well, we, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the second mortgage. Where do you work? I said, nowhere. <laughs> I said, I just got here. I said, you're looking at me, I'm looking for a job. I said, I'll have a job by tomorrow. She said, how do you know? She says, look, I'm going to be out there and get a job. So they gave us the mortgage. Next morning, I called her up. I said, I got a job. Who you got a job with? Grand Union. Grand Union Supermarket. Competition of A&P. And uh, I got the job. They put me in training in the produce department. And within three weeks, they gave me a score as a produce manager. And then finally, I ended up in a locale where there was a fight going on between Grand Union and AMP, and especially the produce departments. And I said, okay, this is my time. This is my time to shine. And I tell you what, I was working for, for Grand Union for 10 years. And uh, How long were you in Florida working? Ten years. Ten years there before. Ten years in New York. Before, oh boy, before he moved out of Florida. Ten years. Ten years before AMP moved in. Well, before AMP, I, I struggled with them for about. I'm well. I struggled with them for one year, and then after that, I stayed about six months. I just did nothing. Just, just relaxed. You know, because she had a sister there, and. Uh, her husband was doing fishing on a fishing boat with shrimp. And so, you know, I had a little fun. But uh, in New York, yes, that was very interesting. And then, of course, you know, the kids grow up. You know, meanwhile, I had uh, um, my son, I had my son, my do two daughters, and my son. And then, of born course... Born in Florida? Paul was born in Florida. Linda was born in Canada, oh, wow. and Tracy was born in Carmel, New York, the youngest one. And uh, when Tracy was only, what, three, four years old, Linda graduated from high school in Mayapak, and uh, she wanted to become a, um, she wanted to further her education. And she was accepted of all places in interior decorating, at ASU, wow. Arizona State. <laughs> okay. So I said, fine. I said, we just meanwhile, we lived in a beautiful place, upstate New York. My, my sister, when she was alive in Toronto, always said, come on over, come and visit. And I said, yeah, we will, we will. And then she came to visit us. She says, now I see why you don't want to come visit. <laughs> you on vacation here. Look at you. It was just Eden. A paradise. And uh, the second mortgage was paid up. I was, just, was sitting on a... I was paying on a brand new, beautiful, a, a three-split-level home. Wow. And a huge piece of property, green and everything. I'm paying a mortgage for $101 a month. Wow. And I'm this far away from being a supervisor... And my wife says, no, we all are moving to Arizona. Because I'm not going to send my, my daughter into the Wild West. <laughs> all right, so here we are. Okay. Sold the house, everything. Send my furniture in a, in a, in a big, big uh, Allied van. Got a little hitch trailer for the personal belongings, and off we went yeah. like gypsies. Wow. Came to, we came to somewhere in like around July in 1970. The heat was so bad. <laughs> and well, so. We came at a good time in the 70s. That's pretty good. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. You got to tell me a little bit, if you will, about uh, you. I guess you started working again. Or, here? Yes, here in... 
Well, at first, I, at first, I didn't want to work. Uh, at first, you because didn't have to. <laughs> we had we had some money left over, and uh, my wife was that thrifty gal. She says, "You know, uh, well, we need to find a house to live in." And I said, "Well, I said, you know, this requires a little thinking. You don't just grab a house and move in. You know, you have to find. We've got to get acquainted here with the locales." see which is, which is what and let's just go into an apartment for a while and and, and see that's wasting money <laughs> so she shows me a newspaper and she says what's well, here look at this here's 13 units 12 rentals and one unit for owners to live in three bedrooms that would be perfect for us well we bought it and we lost it. Simple as that. In other words, we bought it, we lived there, everything was fine and great and dandy. And uh, what happened is that we had more money left over, so I bought a business. It was an Orange Julius. I don't know if that's familiar. Did that ring a bell, Orange Julius, no. with you? Yes, it does. I know. Yeah. It. And that was a very good location. It was the one, at that time, you know, when they count the traffic, that was the best location. That was Camelback and Central. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a hot corner. Wow. It is. It's a, it's a, it's a Q, wow. QU now. It's a QU. That's where the train goes there now. Doesn't it? Central Avenue and Camelback? Well, no, it just turns around there. But this was, no, that's a Derrick and a DQ. Oh, DQ. DQ. Yeah. Okay. It turns out that I wasn't able to run both of them at the same time. It took too much time. And uh, so I put Paul to work part-time. He was going to Camelback High. I put him to work at the, at the uh, Orange Julius. And I was running Orange Julius, running the apartments. And now my wife says, well, you know, we're going to get uh, at the uh, daycare. I said, well, what else? <laughs> Can we get something else? I said, well, we have it. I mean, you know, how how do you expect me to run all this? You're going to run something? Yeah, I'm going to be at the daycare. So good. Then I'll be at the apartments in the uh, Orange Julius. That work out fine. What is Orange Julius? I've never heard. Orange of it. Julius is a is a is a franchise in which they sell a drink which is made out of a special secret powder, oh. which you add to orange juice, squeezed fresh squeezed orange juice and sugar water. Oh, is it still around? Yeah. yeah. And it's actually very good. And some people, they have requests. They can put, you can put raw eggs in there and mix it with a blender. Yeah. It's very good. And then you sell, you've got, uh, you can sell donuts, you can sell coffee. Oh, it's like a little store. Yeah. And you can, uh, you can, oh, and you can hamburgers, hot dogs, french fries, uh, chili, uh, okay. uh Fish witches, okay. you know, and that's about that's about the size of it. Okay. And sandwiches. And uh, so Paul was running it as much as he could, and I would run it. But the franchise calls for you have to be open from six in the morning till twelve at midnight. Wow, eighteen hours. Yes, <laughs> and that became the problem. You know, I don't mind being there till 6, but 12. <laughs> and then being in daycare at 6 in the morning, that just doesn't work right. <laughs> so I hired people. So you hire people, right? Yeah. This is what you're supposed to do. But for some strange reason, I would come in the morning, and there would be hardly any food in the refrigerator and no money in the, in the, in the safe. You were stealing? And I, yeah, I said to myself, wait a minute, that doesn't, it, it, this is not right, something is wrong. So I started asking in the neighborhood and I said, oh yeah, he said, you didn't know, he's got a party every night. The whole parking lot is full of cars with young guys and they're playing, the, 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 the radio's loud and they're eating and they're drinking. For free. For so I right. staked them out one night with Paul and sure enough. There it was, and I just walk in there, and I said, give me the keys. You're out of here, buddy. So, so I was running it there for a few days, and next door there was a real estate agent, post-real estate. Real, real estate. 
He comes in and says, you want to sell your business? I said, yep. The price right? He said, I got the people right in the office. Bring them in. Sold the business. Wow. The only problem is, wow. Yeah, I said, wow, too, after about three months. <laughs> I'm not getting my money. Right. They must have sold to somebody and they got the whole money in full and left. And the other people couldn't pay the bills and somebody put the padlock on and that was it. You got four minutes. So meanwhile, I sold the apartments to some accountant, a single man from Austria, and uh, he ran this place down within two months. It was in shambles. He chased everybody out, and then he comes back to me and says, I'm going to sue you because I lost all the customers, all the tenants. I said, well, I said, look at, look at your pool. It's green. Look at your laundry room. It's filthy. I said, well, your grass is overgrown and dead. Your garbage is accumulating on the parking lot. Hello? Who wants to live in a, in a, in a pigsty? So he sued me. So I had a lawsuit on my hands. So the only thing I had, I lost the uh, Orange Julius. The lawsuit on the uh, thing continued for three years until it was one particular attorney calls me and says, I'm representing Mr. Engel now. I said, well, what is your name? He said, my name is Ryan. I said, would you be the son of Dudley Ryan? He said, yeah. I said, talk to me. I said, he says, why? I said, I know your dad. He used to come and have coffee and donuts in my orange Julius. Oh, so you're the Oscar Noble. I said, yeah. <laughs> so we talked about the whole lawsuit. He wasn't supposed to talk to me about it. So after about an hour on the phone, I said, do you know what you just did? I said, <laughs> I said, I, said, I, said I don't want to be mean. He said, I said, but i tell you one thing. You've got a client who has changed lawyers three times. He says, we were in front of a judge. A judge who threw him out and his lawyer, because his lawyer came in, he was not prepared. You know who the judge was? No. Sandra Day O'Connor. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and my attorney said, this is going to be funny, you watch and see. I said, why? He says, just watch. She doesn't like to be, you know, you're not supposed to talk. Then in the, in the hallway we talk, she says, to my attorney, he says, can you imagine, don't they ever learn? He says, when you, how can you come not prepared in front of a judge? And he smiled, he says, hey, I never have that problem, do I? He says, no. I said, if we had everybody like you, I'd lose the case. <laughs> <laughs> and we only got uh, three minutes more. Okay, so needless to say, I settled it out of court. You know, it's just to pay off my lawyer, pay them off, get it out of the way, because you have litigation on you. This is a mark which you need to shake. And I got rid of it. And as it turned out, the daycare center was the only good business because I was able to run it 100% by myself with help, but they were under my thumbs. Yeah. In other words, I could watch and, and see what they were doing. When I was getting ready to sell out, of course I called downtown and uh, the guy that they had, uh, Hancho, said to me, he says, oh, why would you want to do that? He says, <laughs> do you know you said the landmark? You're the first person in the state of Arizona who ran it, operated, and owned it for 23 years. Wow. The longest ever. Yeah. He says, you set the record. <laughs> I said, well, give me then the job. I want your job. <laughs> Evidently, I'm doing something right, so maybe I can yeah. tell the other folks what to do. <laughs> no, I... I I I have to pat myself on the on, on the shoulder. I had the uh, tar Department of Social Security. They they I, anybody all the departments they would call me up. We have problem children. Can you take care of them? They would send them to me. 
I mean, they had so many daycare centers. They would. I said, well, what's wrong with the other people? Oh, they keep them for a day and, and, and they're back. They don't know what to do with them. I think what I've learned during the war, the type of what I had to go through to think fast, to to cope with things, helped me to show and tell the other people that there's ways of doing things in life. In other words, you, you, the capacity of a person to perform is in within you. You do not have to depend on somebody else all the time to tell you what to do. This is why I always say sometimes, you know, because many people get up, upset when I say I don't go too much to the synagogue because basically, fundamentally, the man up front has nothing for me to say. I, I don't have to listen to him because I know it all. <laughs> if I'm at the point where he has to tell me what to do, dumb, I'm beyond help. I'm done. And that goes for any church, for any house of worship. If you cannot understand what you were brought on to do in this world, then something is wrong. It has to come from within, not to be told. You can tell your children once what to do, but if you have to repeat it continuously, then they're not right. There's something wrong. Once is enough. Be told what to do, do it, and let that stay with you. It's simple, but it's true. It's a, life is very simple. It's true. It's so simple. You know, did you know you were born and you didn't have to pay anything for it? Today, now, for everything you do, you have to pay. <laughs> Food and everything. This life was given to you completely free. Here. Got one minute left. So life is what you make it. It can be good, it can be bad. It all depends. When you get up in the morning, you have to say to yourself, what do I want to do today? What do I want to accomplish today? Who do I want to help? Because certainly, you don't want to harm anyone. I mean, there's, there's nothing in there. Harming someone, even an animal, is something you don't want to do. It's all there for a purpose, and you have to take care of it. That's good. You have a final line that you want to slip in. Tolerance. You, I guess that was your message. Tolerance is the message. You have to be tolerant to people. Get along. Share. Embrace them. And don't holler at them. Don't hate them. Because hate does not accomplish anything. Nothing. Peace and tolerance is the best way to go. It makes a happy person. And life should be happy. You know, why go to bed, worry about this and that? No. You want to be a happy person. I think that's great. Tolerate.